you get into this first firefight, you're the, the junior officer. It's understood at the outset that the senior enlisted guy is going to help the junior officer, you know, ease into the role, but you are the person in command. You're the platoon leader. So like the junior enlisted guy, you're carrying the, the burden of war, the burden of combat, but you're also carrying the burden of being the leader. What, what, what were those, what were the, the additional challenges that you had to carry as the officer, as the platoon leader? Most of those guys were my age. You know, uh, the oldest guy I had in my platoon was 27. Um, we had, well, first of all, my platoon only had about 25 people in it. Mm. it supposed to be up, uh, the table of organization and equipment calls for 43 wow. in a platoon. Yeah. So with 25 guys, I've got a staff sergeant, which is an E6. I've got a couple of E5 sergeants, some spec fours, PFCs. That's about it. And With them being my age, one of the things that I had the most trouble with was um, wanting to be their friends, but not being able to be their friend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it'd be different if we had had a full company. It'd be different if we were in garrison rather than in combat. But what I soon found out was that I have to be their friend. I have to be close enough to them that they trust me. They will follow my orders. And they had to understand that I would never give them an order to do anything that I wouldn't do myself because that developed the trust that I needed. So I walked point. Wow. I, I'm kind of big, but I still got in tunnels and, and did that part of it. I went out on LPs on listening posts um, I went out on ambushes. I did all the things that I would request of them. And, and that and, really helped. That really helped. Yeah. And you did these things not necessarily because you were gung ho, but because you wanted, as a leader, you needed to demonstrate that I'm, I'm willing to do these things as well. Yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> I was not gung ho. No. Mm -hmm. I, um, even though I'd, you know, done all of the things that, um, gone through all the schools and stuff, but I still, I needed to have their approval as their leader, but I also had to make sure that they'd always follow my orders. Mm -hmm. And that was a, that was a, a real narrow line. Um, that I, I had to walk. Now, I got a, I got an old E7 who came in as a platoon sergeant and he didn't want anything to do with the field. He wanted to be in the rear. He, he, and he'd been in, he'd been in Korea. So he'd been around a while, you know, he was real close. He was like within a year of retiring. Wow. And he, he didn't want to be out there in the field. And every day he'd ask me what he could do to get to the rear. And I told him, I said, you know, you're like the rest of us. We got to put in our time. Wow. You know, 
the officers at that point would do six or seven months in a field and then they'd get a rear job doing something. Enlisted would do eight or nine months in a field and then get a rear job. And that's what we tried to do. Yeah. So he's first, he was the only guy I ever knew of that, that uh, I, I'm pretty sure he did. I think he, he injured himself um, mm. and to get out of the field. Uh, how, uh, how, how did he do that? With a 45 caliber pistol. Mm. He shot himself in the, in the, in the, uh, the calf of his left leg. Mm. He shot himself in the calf so that it'd be a through and through. But, you know, choosing a 45 was not a smart thing to do. That's a nasty weapon. That's like an area type weapon. You know, you hit somebody in the arm, it'll take the arm off. Wow. Did he do this during a firefight so that he could say he'd been yeah. in a fight? Yeah. Bullet hole was way too big for an AK-47. We, yeah. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't press any charges against him. Actually, it was a good thing to, get re to be rid of him because he had a, such a poor attitude. So, um, but those those boys that that fought with me, they um, they were a great bunch of guys.